Okay, Boker Tov, everybody. Chag uh, Sameach. Uh, today, of course, is actually Chag HaPesach. If you look in the Chumash, um, the Torah makes a clear distinction between Chag HaPesach and Chag HaMatzah in, in Parshat Amor. I guess we'll read it on the second day of Yonte, where the Torah begins that on <clears throat> the 14th is when we bring the Korban Pesach today, really in the afternoon, but uh, the 14th of Nisan. And then on Bechamishasar Yom on the 15th day is Chag Hamatzon. And we'll discuss a little bit later when why the when Chag Hamatzon and Chag HaPesach actually join together, of course, at the Seder. Um, but uh, today it is officially Chag HaPesach. And tonight begins Chag Hamatzon. Rav Levi Yitzchak of Berdichev, I remember you, has a cute fort, you know, where he was always defending the Jewish people, always looking for the, the good side of the Jews. So he has a comment that why do we call it, it Chag HaPesach? It's not really Chag HaPesach, it's really Chag HaMatzot. And why does uh, God call it Chag HaMatzot? So he says, we can call it Chag HaPesach because we want to give gratitude to God because God passed over our homes and he saved us. So we're talking about the greatness of God. And God wants to talk about the greatness of the Jewish people that we eat matzah, we get rid of our, our chametz, we left in a hurry. But be that as it may, um, really, really Chag HaPesach and Chag HaMatzah are two distinct holidays, but that's not the focus of what we want to talk about. So I want to pick up where we left off on Monday, which is basically uh, the four questions. Manishtana, Laila, Zem, Yichol, Halaylot. We're not going to spend a lot of time on Manishtana, actually. That's a common, I mean, lots of people spend lots of time. There's a lot to discuss about that, but I'll just mention a few points. First of all, it's not even clear if it's one, one question, four answers, or four questions, or five questions, or used to be three questions, because one of the big problems people have is the Agada never directly answers the questions, right? They never really did. What is the... To why we we know Zavadim so that's just you know out there. But also maybe it's one question. Manishtan Allah said the Allah. The question is what does Mam mean? Does Mam mean why or what? Right? Manishtan normally Mam means what? But when the uh, but often it could mean why when the Chacham asks Mahe Chukim Vamishvatim Asher Tziva Shem Olkenu. What are the the uh, the testimonies and the laws? We assume he doesn't mean what. He means why. Why Why do we have to have all these thoughts? Not so much. So that's a question. Does Ma mean what? Or, or how is this night different? It's not easy to translate. It's often, and of course, that's done on purpose, right? The Hebrew and the Torah especially is always vague because it wants to allow multiple in, interpretation. I mean, but they're both correct. Let's read the question as how, or what, why, etc. So maybe it's one question and four answers. But I do want to point out something that, I don't know if it's so well known, but it's uh, kind of actually fascinating if you think about it. So I'm going to share my screen. We're going to take a look at the Mishnah. The um, <clears throat> the Seder is actually pretty much described in the Mishnah in Psachim. The, um, we don't know who wrote the Haggadah. We, <clears throat> we don't know, but much of the Haggadah, not all of it, appears in the Mishnah in the 10th parak in Masech Psachim. Now, as we mentioned last week, the Mishnah sort of goes through the four stages of the Haggadah, the four cups of wine. We drink the four cups of wine because there are four parts of the Seder. There is Kiddush, Magi telling the story, eating, and Halal, and Shira. And those four parts of the Seder each require a cup of wine. <clears throat> so the Mishnah began on, on Kiddush, and then the Mishnah continues they pour for him. That's the custom that other people pour on our behalf. We're like kings. Mazgulo Kosheni. Bechana ben Shoel. Aviv. And here is when the child asks the father. So the what does the child ask? The mission doesn't say. The mission doesn't say because the mission doesn't care. Because it really doesn't matter what question the kid asks. The point is the kid is supposed to ask questions. If he doesn't ask questions, Shaino Yo Daily Show, unfortunately, lots of people like that. He ain't that the then of doesn't know enough to ask, his father teaches him. What does his father teach him? Manishtana, Laila Zemikola Lilot. So if you look in the Mishnah, Manishtana is exactly said by the father, not said by the child. Because the Mishnah says the father asks, Im ain't that. if the child doesn't know, so the father teaches him. Okay, we teach him, so we got to teach him the basics. So the four questions, everybody knows. And the most, you know, even Jews who are quite, a, I don't know everybody, but uh, even Jews who are quite far from our tradition, the four, the four questions, they all know. So, but it's fascinating how it developed from 
the way it's presented in the Mishnah, the way we do it today. And just to show you that it doesn't really matter. So then the Mishnah continues. So you got to teach the child according to uh, his abilities. He's a bright child. You have to ask a lot of questions, not so encouraged or interested. You ask fewer questions. We start with the negative. Either Avadim Hayinu, we were slaves, or Mitchilo of the Avodazara, you Avatenu, or our ancestors were idol worshippers. Those are two different Haggadah. We do both of them, right? There's a debate in the Talmud. What does it mean we start with the negative? Is it Avadim Hayinu, or is it that our ancestors were idol worshippers? We, of course, do both. Mesayim Beshevach, we end with the praise, let's say Hallel. That's the Seomad, Mabi Keshlavan Arami. That's the um the four verses of the Bikurim, of the um the first fruit that the farmer brings. And if you look in the Mishnah, it says Achi Igmor Kola Parsha Kula. He says the entire parsha. A parsha, of course, in the Torah means like the paragraph breaks. And those are two extra verses we do not say in our Haggadah, because those two verses spoke about coming to the land of Israel. In other words, the goal of the Exodus, as we mentioned, is to get the Torah. That's really just a stop on the way. The goal of the Exodus, always God tells Moshe, is to bring him to the land flowing with milk and honey. So we, um, and then, and the Pesach Seder, we say that whole Parsha, God took us, Arami Ovedavi, my ancestor was the wandering Aramean, and we cried out to God and went to Egypt, we were forced, etc. That whole stuff in the middle, we do very quickly because it's late and it's a little bit more boring, it's a little bit harder. And uh, But that's really the core um, text of the Haggadah, at least from a learning point of view. And then you continue and the farmer says, thank you very much. I, you brought me to this land. You took me out of Egypt. We cried out to you. And here are these wonderful fruits. So we don't say that last part. The simple reason is because the Mishnah was written when the Jews lived in the land of Israel. The farmer would say, when we lived in Poland, uh, you're not going to say it's very negative. When we uh, give thank you, God, for taking us to the land of Israel, we're not in the land of Israel. That's what we said. We do halach manyat. We're in exile. So we cut out the last two verses. But from the Mishnah, it's pretty clear you should really say the whole thing. I don't know, maybe today in Israel. So then the and then the Mishnah said, the Gemara says, if you're smart, chacham, the child ask. If not, his wife asked, and that's kind of an interesting comment, right? First, the child, if not, they go to the children, if not, the spouse. If not, you ask yourself. Even two Torah scholars who know the laws of Pesach, interesting, says the laws here, not the story. You've got to ask questions. That's the key. The most important thing, what you ask, much less important. And here you have... Um, yeah, I'm really Rav Nachman Daru Abde. Rav Nachman said to his servant Daru, Abde the Mafik le Mari le Chayrut biav le Kasper the Dahaba. A master freed his slave, and he gave him a gold, uh, a gold, you know, cup. My by le Marle. What should he say to him? What should the slave do? I'm really by la do de la shvuchi. Has to say thank you and praise him. So he said to him, I don't have to say, say I don't have to say that anymore. We already said the uh, we had a question. You gave an answer. It's great. So he skipped Manishtana. So I don't know what would happen at our Seder if you skip Manishtana. I don't think it would go over too well. But you see, this is you know how the uh, how Jewish you know what becomes very uh, people become very attached to, and what is really more minor in importance. The Arami Oved Avi section of the Haggadah is clearly more I don't say more important, but it's more fundamental to the notion of the Pesach Seder than it then is um, the Manishtana itself. Manishtana is just a way to get the discussion going. So it's always you know say yeah any questions nobody asks a question. Once the first question starts, then you. Usually, a lot of questions will follow. I, I, you know, so that's really the goal of the Manishtana, and uh, that's the key. Asking questions, of course, is curiosity. Okay, we'll leave it at that. Uh, we, um, the questions have changed a little bit over time, and um, that's a uh, okay. We'll um, we do. We'll discuss perhaps another time. Okay, I want to. Um, Let's go. Avadim Hayinu. So we start this story. Uh, Avadim Hayinu, we were slaves to Paro. Now, where does Avadim Hayinu appear in the Chumash? Any, uh, uh, it's not a fair question. I just wrote about it in the Dvar Torah I sent out last night, but uh, I don't expect anybody to have read it yet. But wh wh the verse, where does the verse Avadim Hayinu come from? Do you want to unmute yourself or uh, put it in the chat box? That'd be great. Anybody? 
So Avadim Ayinu is a verse in Dvarim. It's not in Shmot. Most of the text of the Haggadah come from Sefer Dvarim. Mikra Bikurim, that we just said, Aremi Oved Avi, is in Dvarim. In other words, we do not read the Exodus as a historical event as it happened in Shmot. If you're telling the story of the Exodus, you would open up Shmot for Eira, Bo, B'Shalach, right? That's not what we do at all. I mean, it's very long, but we only take four verses or six verses, elaborate on it. From a historical perspective, you know, Dvarim is learning the lessons of history. Dvarim is saying, Moshe Rabbeinu is telling the Jewish people, what did you do wrong? Or what were the mistakes you made? He starts with the, the, the Maraglim. That's the opening story in Dvarim. Don't make the mistake of the spies. Otherwise, you'll be another 40 years in the desert. Um, so Sefer Dvarim is really the, the lessons of history, not so much history. In history is morality and ethics and to teach us how to live our life. So pretty much the Torah, um, the, the psukim all come from Dvarim. So Avadim Ayinu is a pasuk in Dvarim, sixth chapter. What, what's it a response to? It's a response to the question of the Chacham. The, in the Torah, that's what I wrote my Dvar Torah last, I sent out last night. The Chacham asked a question. As a matter of fact, why don't we go there right now? Why don't I share my screen and I'll show you. Um, as you know, um, let's see. I hope I have it here. I think I do. Um, give me a second. Exodus, barring. Here we go. Okay. So you have the Shema. Just to get a little bit of context. Shema Yisrael Hashem Alkeinu Hashem Achad only appears in Barim. Not for now. And then uh, right afterwards, uh, Moshe tells the Jewish people, God will bring you into this wonderful land. You're going to have big homes, be beautiful homes. Don't get carried away. You're going to get too wealthy and too arrogant. Uh, and uh, Don't do that. Don't make that mistake. Focus on God. Don't, don't worship. Worship idols, don't worship money, whatever. And then, uh, and then the Torah says, "Vasita Yesharva." One of the key verses in the Torah to do the to straight and the good. The Ramban puts this as a fundamental principle of the Torah. This is where Lifnim Mishuradin, going above the law, is. This will how we will inherit the land. And then, This is what we all know as the question of the Chacham. You'll notice it has nothing to do with Pesach. Not, the Torah is not talking about Pesach at all. Uh, nothing to do with anything. He's asking what the Torah is. The authors of the Haggadah put this into the notion of um, the Pesach Seder and the Chacham. Now, Avadim Yilim is not an answer to why we have Pesach. It's an answer to why we observe all the mitzvot of the Torah. We're not talking about Pesach. In the Haggadah, in the Midrash, the the uh, the four children is based on a mechilta. It's based on midrash. In the midrash, we're talking about about Pesach. But in the Torah, Avadim Mayinu is the response to why we keep all the mitzvot of the Torah, not just the four questions. Which of course makes sense if the four questions are just examples, and you can really ask whatever you want. And um, that we say, okay. So the, this Avadim Mayinu is the response to the Chacham. And I wrote, well, why is it put there? Why is it not put? Um, in the Chacham, so that uh, maybe we'll get to a little bit today, and a little bit I, I wrote about that. Okay, I just want to add, um, we're going to, you know, pick and choose, obviously, there's so much here to discuss. Um, even if, afilu kulanu chachamim, kulanu nivonim, no matter how much we know, we it, there's the mitzvah to speak about Yitziat Mitzrayim. Saper Yitziat Mitzrayim, mechol hamar bela saper harezah meshubach. The more the merrier. Well, why the more the merrier? I know it's a funny question. In other words, I, I, I mentioned that those who are at my, my sitter class, I've often mentioned the, the whole notion of uh, a korban mincha, flower offering. The Mishnah ends off in Menachat, we don't believe in quantity, we believe in quality. It doesn't matter if you do more or less, provided your heart is devoted to heaven. But obviously, that's, that's uh, obviously we feel that, let's say, the more Torah you learn, the better it is. So the more you tell a story, the more it influences you. That's the idea. It's not to tell the story. It's not that there's a mitzvah to go for five hours. The mitzvah is that you should be influenced. That's the goal of the Seder. The goal of the Seder is to re-experience 
what it means to go from exile to freedom, what it means to be free. I remember years ago when Rabbi, Rabbi Tandler in NYU the, passed away this, this you know, you know, past year. I remember when I was in Yeshiva University during the Iran-Iraq war in the 80s. So I remember he said that he thinks it's a mitzvah to talk about the Iran-Iraq war at your Seder. Obviously, we cannot have an appropriate Seder if you don't talk about what's going on in Ukraine and Russia. I'm not, this, we're not talking politics here. We're talking morals and ethics. The, the Seder is the, the world event of freedom, political freedom, religious freedom, liberty. So it's Bechol Dor Dor, Bechol Hamar Belisaper. You're not telling the story of the Exodus in Sefer Shmot. That's not the goal. The Psukim don't even come, as we said. They come from from Varn. The goal is what are the lessons we learn and how do we apply it to our lives today? So that's why Chola Marvela Saper, that takes a lot of work. Uh, and the rate, what I've often said, right, the, in, in many ways, uh, we, it, would be be, it would be better not to have a text to the Haggadah because you have a free-flowing discussion, but it's hard to work that way. And that's, you know, the text should just be a, a, a springboard. And if you skip a few pieces here and there, it doesn't matter so much. I don't want to sound like, a, you know, a what, but it's not so important that you say every single word. It's important, if you don't say these three things, you didn't fulfill your obligation. But, you know, I'm not recommending it. But if, if you skip... Uh, if you skip the story of the five rabbis in Pamei Brak, that we're going to talk about in a second, the world won't come to an end. Now, we, we read that because there are important lessons we can learn. But the goal of the Seder is to relate the events of the Exodus and freedom and the relationship to God and Jewish peoplehood to our lives today. And the Haggadah is the springboard in how to do it. But it's not like... Uh, that the, every word is is sanctified, that it's so holy. Okay, anyway, so, okay, so I want to spend now a few minutes on the five rabbis in Bnei Brak. This is, a, I think, a favorite part. Uh, the problem we all have, and I, I, where I'm as guilty as everybody else, I don't know, maybe you're not guilty, but I'm guilty. What happens? The first parts of the Haggadah are, are very interesting. And, you know, Manishtana and Halachmanya and the five rabbis and all these, you know, and the four children, that's really interesting. And we spend, you know, an hour and a half on that. And then it's already 10 o'clock because uh, we're on daylight saving time. And it's 10 o'clock. We haven't gotten to the main part of the Seder. By the way, the five rabbis, the, the uh, you know, doesn't really, have, even the, uh, the four children don't really appear in the Mishnah. He said, depending on his, how wise he is, you teach him. The main parts, Arami uh, Ovedavi, that we do very quickly. Maybe we should start the Seder with Arami Ovedavi and then put the, this part at the end of the Seder. I don't know. But I'm because, um, or maybe every year you should focus on different aspects of the Seder. But be it as it may, the, the story of the five rabbis, a fascinating story. It's, it's the proof that we should be talking a lot about the Exodus. So these five great rabbis, the, these are the rabbis in the generation after the destruction of the temple, or maybe two generations after the destruction of the temple. You know, there's a Rabbi, Rabbi Tarfan is older, Rabbi Lazar ben Azaria is younger. <clears throat> these five great rabbis are sitting in the home of Rabbi Akiba. And their students come and their students tell them, rabbis, the time to say Shema in the morning has come. A chutzpah, no? Is that the chutzpah of the kids, the students? Does anybody think it's a chutzpah of the students or the students are right? Put it in the chat. Are the students right or wrong? Their, their teachers are having a say there. They're discussing the action. They're having a great all night discussion. They really got into it. An all night discussion about liberty and freedom. And their students go, ah, uh, ah. Uh, Minion, Hashkama Minion. Hashkama Minion says at 6.02, let's end the Seder. A chutzpah, right? So how, how do they do such a thing? And you know what? How, when, when can you say Kriyat Shema in the morning until? In, I don't know, till 9, 10, 10, 10, 10 in Toronto, you know, a, a, a little earlier. Whatever, you can say Kriyat Shema till 9.30, 10 o'clock in the morning. Ilana, you think they're right. How come? If you want, if you're not afraid to, to speak up, if I can ask you, it is the Pesach Seder. Because the rabbis were so carried away with their discussion that right. they were devastated that they realized that they missed the time for the same Mishma. Why were they going to miss the time? They have they have three hours. Yeah, Unless you want to say they waited, they waited till nine o'clock in the morning to ask them. That's not the impression you get. The impression they got is they woke at 5.30 in the morning. The earliest time to say Shema, they knocked on their doors and said, Rabbis, the Seder's over. 
Uh, I never uh, had that impression. I thought it was like already nine o'clock when they came. Uh, so of course we don't know. I, I mean, I'm just raising the question because I think I think there's something uh, at work here. This is not. Now there is an idea. It is true. The halakha says that if your teacher does something wrong, there's no mitzvah to honor a teacher who's doing something wrong. And exactly what Stephen points out, osek be mitzvah patrimen mitzvah. When you're doing one mitzvah, you don't have you don't interrupt it to do another mitzvah. You are exempt from the other mitzvah. So why not say the mitzvah of Sipur Yitzhi Mitzrayim override Shema? Now, if you think about it, why do we say um where does the mitzvah, why, why do we say Shema, at least? Why do we say the, the third paragraph of the Shema? It's to remind yourself of the Exodus. In other words, why does the Shema have three paragraphs? The third paragraph, Lamantis, these gurus, uh, it's all about Anishim Mitzrayim. The reason we say it, because the Exodus knew, Sipur Yitzim Mitzrayim, saying to say there is, is more than Shema, and they're, they're doing even more than the Shema in, the, in a certain sense. So I think here, um, I don't know this, uh, you'll, you'll tell me if you think I'm way off base or it's an interesting idea because I haven't seen this really. Um, it's, it's, it would appear that there is some kind of a tension between the mitzvah of Kriyat Shema, Shal Shachrit. You notice they didn't say he gives man Kriyat Shema. I mean, it's obvious it's the Shema of the morning. It's he gives man Kriyat Shema, Shal Shachrit. The morning Shema has come, obviously, not the, the nighttime Shema. I mean, they were talking for 24 hours. No. Means the morning. Why do they have to say that? Now, Shema is unless you can think of another mitzvah. I believe it's the only mitzvah in the Torah, like that's time-bound mitzvah that you do in the day and at night. Every other mitzvah is either in the day or night. That's the Mishnah Megillah, Shofar, even Mikra Megillah. Mikra Megillah at night is a later day minak, never mentioned in the Mishnah. According to the Mishnah and the second Megillah, you only read the Megillah in the day. We, I'm sure more, many people know it's much more important day. Of course, most more people come at night than in the day, but you know that's the way we are. But every mitzvah, lulav, shofar, every mitzvah is only in the day and night. Um, korbanot are only in the daytime. You don't have any mitzvah. Matzah is only at night. Sukkah, the obligation to sit in sukkah is only at night. Right, everything is either at the night of the day. Shema is the only mitzvah that we have to do twice a day, in the morning and the evening. Why? Why? Never thought of that question. Okay, so um, I think because night and day in Judaism are very uh, powerful ideas. See, we live in a world where we've done away with a lot of this because we have lights. We, we, we have day at night, you know, we, we, we don't, it's not so important. We go by clocks, you know, 904, you know, uh, whatever. They didn't go by clocks. They went, life revolved around the sun and the clock was a sundial, right? The day and the night are very different. Uh, the day represents hope and the night represents fear. And Avram and Jacob, the, the, God tells Jacob at night, don't be afraid to go to Egypt, right? We, we, the, the Seder has to be at night. There's only special about night. Now, Kriyat Shema has to be said in day and at night. Why? So I think because Kriyat Shema is about accepting the yoke of heaven, about accepting God. And the idea is that we have to accept God in good times and bad times. So the Shema represents Kabbalat Oma Chuchemai. We accept the uh, God's mitzvah and we accept his authority, even when it's nighttime. And of course, we accept it. And sometimes we're liable to forget about God in the daytime because things are so good. And we're liable to be mad at God in the nighttime. So the Shema is, it has to be said at night and at day. Now, when do we leave Egypt? In the day or at night? Put, down, uh, put it down in the chat box. When do we actually leave Egypt? When, when do we leave our homes? You know, we had a, at night or in the daytime? Day. Okay. Nobody else, everybody's afraid to answer. Don't worry, I won't bite you at night. There we go. Ah, great. So it's one to one. Okay. So um, why do you say this? What, what's your basis for saying it's a day? And what's the basis for saying it's at night? Does the Torah tell us? So, of course, the Torah tells us. What's the problem? Is the Torah contradicts itself? Let's take a quick look. We'll start doing that in our Siddish here, like the, we're up to Rabbi Shmuel right? Two verses that contradict each other. So let's take a look here. So here we left, um, um, Mahimi Kates, 
30 years, and after 430 years, and he's at some time of that. At some time of that, like in the in broad daylight. That's how the rabbis interpret it. But he at in the middle of the day, and the Egyptians won't stop us. We walked out of Egypt, right? And we have other psukim. Hayom yitzat them. We land in in the, in the daytime. Here, it's a very strange pasuk. Shamor chodesh aviv, pasita pesach. Keep the spring festival. Make Pesach. Uh, when? Doesn't matter what date. As long as it's in the month of Aviv. Why? Because in the month of Aviv, God took you out of Egypt at night. It's like a very strange thing. Keep the month of Aviv. This is why we have to have a leap year this year. Pesach has to be in the spring. It's, it's an agricultural motif beyond history. Make the Pesach. That's the Korban Pesach. Because in the month of Aviv, in the spring month, the Nisan, Iyar, those are Babylonian names, came about later. God took us out of Egypt at night. At night. So the Torah basically contradicts itself. Um, do we leave Egypt in the day or do we leave Egypt at night? So it is a, it's a, you resolve the contradiction. They started leaving in the night. They only got out in the day, whatever the contradiction is. Now, I think uh, maybe this is a little bit too much, but um, right, we have a whole, um, when we get to the end of the Haggadah, one of the songs we sing is, and we go through all the things that happen at, at night, at midnight, uh, uh, Avraham fighting with the four kings and uh, and Avimelech, you know, God appearing to him when he took, he kidnapped, you know, Sarah and uh, Chashverosh couldn't sleep. And we go through all the things, and then how do we end that song? We end that song with Karav Yom Asher Hulo Yom Below Laila. There will be a day where there's going to be no night and no day. What does that mean? There's going to be no night and no day. So uh, the Torah in Parsha Noah tells us that God is never going to ups and nature like that. So what does it mean is the night will turn into the day. Night is fear. Night is exile. Day is redemption, right? So the purpose of Yitzhid Mitzrayim, the, what happened is, is the night turns into day. Egypt is the night. Egypt is the exile. The, the, what we do at the Seder is we take the Pesach, which is in the daytime. The Korban Pesach I started is brought in the daytime. Redemption. Pesach is God taking us out of Egypt. Matzah is slavery. That's the food we ate as slaves. We ate because we are in a big hurry. That's, but that's what halachmania, right? Matzah is night. Matzah is to be eaten at night. But we bring together the matzah and the, and the Pesach and, uh, at night um, because we want to turn the night into day. We, I've mentioned in other occasions that, you know, in the temple, the day didn't start at night. Um, every we all know we're so attuned to it that you know we begin Shabbos on Friday night and we begin the Seder at night. Every every day starts at night. We everybody knows that. And uh, the Rashbam, as you know, it was so controversial. Art Scroll censored it. They refused to publish it. The Rashbam, the grandson of Rashi, uh, says that by he er by he boker means that the day starts in the morning. He doesn't say that halakhically. It's halakhically we keep Shabbos at night. But the pshat of the pasuk. When the boker came, it was Yom Sheni. It was evening and it was day. Yom Shlishi, Yom Revi. The third day started, the fourth day started. So the day always starts in the morning. So that is true halakhically in the temple, right? When you bring a sacrifice, the sacrifice to meet in that day, that day ends the next morning. So because that's because in the temple, in the presence of God, when we, that's the, we, we in the light. It's all about light. In outside of the temple, we have to bring the world darkness. That's the mission of the Jewish people to be an or legoyim, right? To bring light. Like who they might the or of the simcha v'sasson, right? So we have to bring light. We have to bring the temple, so to speak, a miniature temple. We turn our house into a, a temple. So the goal is to convert night into day, not uh, not the darkness, okay? You know, but uh, the concept of night and day. And I think that's what the seder is about. So um, and that's what the song is about. That there will become a day. That that that's how we end the seder. Karav yom. There'll be a time where there's no day and there's no night. There'll be only daytime. There'll be only the Korban Pesach. We won't have, uh, right? That's the debate. Do we say Yitzhiv Mitzrayim? Do we have to mention this in Yemad HaMashiach? Do we even have to talk about Yitzhiv Mitzrayim? And I think what happened perhaps uh, is the students didn't, didn't understand this. The students said there's night and uh, there's day. And the two are, are separate and it's time 
to, you know, the, the Seder's over, and now it's time to say the Shema. And the rabbis were in the notion of sort of combining uh, day and night. Now, if, if that's the case, if I'm right, so then what's Rabbi Lezer? What's the next thing? Rabbi Lezer, and as I say, I was seven years old. I was like 70. And I, I, I couldn't convince my colleagues to say it's Yid Mitzrayim at night. I couldn't convince them to say at night until Ben Zoma came along and said, you have to remember the uh, Exodus, Ko Yimecha Yecha. Yimecha Yecha Yamim, Ko Yimecha Yecha <clears throat> Halelot. Now, if we understand this historically, right, this story, as I mentioned, took place, I don't know, 110, 120. It, it had to take place between the destruction of the temple. They're already in Yavne. Now, of course, who's missing in this story is Raman Gamliel is not here. Raman Gamliel is not, he should be there. He's the Nasi in Yavne. So it's probably when they deposed him as the Nasi for insulting Rabbi Yoshua, who is there. And they appointed Rabbi Lezer ben Azariah, <coughs> who is there. And that would make sense. Rabbi Lezer ben Azariah then speaks up next. He's now the leader of, of the Jewish people. He's the Nasi of the Jewish people. Hareni Kevin Shivim Shana. This story is taking place the year 110, 120, somewhere around that in Yavne. It's a very dark period. Maybe it's the maybe at the as Cecil Roth thought it's taking place during the Bar Kokh revolt in the year 132, 133, whatever. So it's taking place in a very dark period. And nobody wanted to mention um you'd see it means rhyme at night. Who we're in a period of exile. We're, we're, we talk about Egypt only in the daytime. We don't talk about Egypt every night. We're talking about right, we remember God redeems us in the nighttime. No, no. There were, everybody else said, we, I, we only talk about that in the daytime. We cannot talk about that in the nighttime. Rabbi Lazar ben said, no. Even when it's night, even after the destruction and the Hadrianic persecutions and the Romans are massacring us and all the tragedies in, in Jewish history are happening, we remember Yitzhak Mitzrayim, remember God's redemption at night. Remember the night will turn into day. I don't know, maybe this is too much of a stretch, but I thought... I thought it's sort of, and you know, that it's, what's this story? The rabbis say Shema and what the rabbis didn't know. They were so engrossed in the conversation. Could be. And, uh, but it seems to be that there's a tension here between um, the morning Shema, hope, and the evening, right? That, that somehow the evening, they, the students didn't realize what we're doing at, at the Seder is turning the evening into the morning. We're, we're linking Sipur Yitzim Mitzrayim and Kriyat Shema. Okay. We'll, we'll leave that as that. If you like it, very nice. Don't, that's fine too. Okay, let's talk a little bit about the four children. And I want to, um, I already mentioned, we already saw the, the Chacham. I want to give an idea. I don't know how, I think part of it comes from Nechama Leibowitz, although I can't remember 100% if it's all from her. So uh, whatever is good, you can assume it's hers and whatever you don't like, you assume it's mine. Um, so um, one of the, the big problems is what's the difference between the Chacham and the Rasha. Right? So I know the classic reason, Etchem and Lachem, I don't buy that for one second. I, I don't like that answer at all. Etchem and Lachem mean the same thing. The Mavo does what Lachem to you. And my daughter, Etchem, you mean it's more inclusive? I don't know. Maybe. I, I, don't, I don't think that answer um, really, um, it doesn't do it for, for me. So what, what exactly is the difference? So I want to point out, I think it was Nechama who said, I think there are three beautiful little points. Now, I, I'll say one thing for starters. Of course, in the Torah, one of, um, right, there are no four children. It's one child, right? The four discussions in the Torah that the Medra says is four children. The Torah, it's sort of talking, it's not talking to four different children, it's talking to everybody. But we have to talk to each child differently. The Midrash is obviously putting the point that certain parts of the Torah emphasize to this one and other points to this one. You have to talk to each one in a slightly different way. But um, this, what uh, I say now is the difference is not so much in the question, it's in the lead up to the question. So let's take a look at our screen. Let's look how our rabbis read the Chumash with a, what's the expression of fine tune? to find comb, whatever that expression is. They read the Torah very, very carefully. Okay, so if you go here, let's go the Chacham. Ki shachapincha machar lemor. This is the Chacham. There are three differences in those five words between the Chacham, the ki shachapincha machar lemor, and the Rasha. The Rasha is a little bit up here. 
chapter 12, verse 22, or something like that. There are three differences between and the differences Who wants to tell me what the three differences are? Asking and telling. Yeah, so that's the first one. The Chacham asked a question. The Rasha makes a statement. I, everybody knows you can say the exact same words, tone of voice, inflection is all the different. Why do we do this or why do we do this? It's the same words, totally different question. So the Chach, every question is wonderful. That's what we said. The Seder is all about what doesn't matter what you ask. You don't have to ask Manishtana. Any question will do. Questions, questions, statements, mm, that's a problem. So that's difference number one. Ki yishacha ki yomru. Difference number two. Singular and plural. Oh my gosh. Who are you? Who is this person? Ki, uh, well, singular, plural. Explain. Tova. Oh, I just noticed that. I don't you should know. I, if I, I'm gonna, I, I know Tova will get upset at me. <clears throat> Tova was a way better student <clears throat> than I was. <laughs> and any teacher who taught us both couldn't believe we came in the same family. So why can't you be like your sister? You know, yeah. she was Tova and I was not. And we'll leave it at that. Those who know me growing up know exactly what I'm talking about. <clears throat> okay. What's the difference between the, the singular and plural? Sorry, I just can't get a drink here. Tova, you want to explain? <clears throat> um, Why is it significant? That's great. Okay, good. Why is it significant? <clears throat> Yeah, I'm not so sure with this, with the with the plural. So you're gathering people around you. It's like becoming like a mob mentality. Oh, great. Mob mentality. People will do things with other people that they would never do on their own. Everybody knows that. You tell you, any teacher knows the kids who are troublemakers. One on one, most of them are really great kids. It's when they put them with four of their friends that you got a problem. And obviously that's on a small scale. You look at the world events, look at Nazi Germany. When you get a mob, when you get people, look at Russia. It's very easy. People, when it's a big, first of all, nobody has to take any responsibility. It's not me, it's them. So Russia, plural. Greatness is always individualized. Great people, you know, always think independently, right? Most of the great, great Torah scholars did not learn in yeshivot. Even the even in the Lushen, like even the greatest of yeshivot, institutions are are limiting. Uh, you know, Rav Soloveitchik never learned in yeshiva. The Vilna Gaon never learned in yeshiva. They they're they're too great. But uh, that's just a small taste. We all know that. Einstein, you know, great people usually are, are ridiculed. They come up with ideas, and they you you think that the ability to be willing to think for yourself. Abraham Ivri. Abraham was on this side of the river and the whole world was on the other side. That's greatness. And sometimes, it's, again, sometimes you can be crazy. Sometimes the whole world is right. But the Chacham is somebody willing to think independently. And the third difference, Tova, you got difference Excuse number me, three? Rabbi, uh, I didn't understand those differences. I, I don't you, understand what you say that the Chacham is asking a question and the, and the Rasha is making a statement. They don't say ma. I'm sorry. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. It's okay to ask a question. That's good. Making statements. I, I, we're not talking about factual statements. Wait, why, wait, when wait. you make a statement, why do I have to be Jewish as a statement as opposed to a question? You already know what he's saying. He's not, in, he's not interested in that. So I understand that. I understand what you're saying, but I don't understand why the Rasha is not asking the question. He says, because it says in the Torah, because the verse in the Torah says, here, I'll show it to you, because the verse in the Torah says, Vaya Kiyomru. That's how the Torah, that's exactly the point. You have to read it so carefully. You have to read them side by side. And by the Chacham, it says, the fact that the Torah distinguishes between asking and telling means it's significant. And is one person. And is many people. What's the third difference? By now you should have picked it up. The extra word and by the Chacham, what's the extra word? Machar, tomorrow. It's a, the Russia is asking now, the Chacham is asking tomorrow. What, what, what does that all mean? Wise people think short term planning, right? Long term, you know? Uh, I don't have to tell you, in the, everywhere, everywhere. You think about what will be long term. A Chacham has long term planning. 
a rush only thinks about the here and now. That's so true about so much of life. So those are three little differences. They don't appear in the Haggadah. You, you understand? In other words, the authors of the Haggadah, I mean, this really only works if we're talking to wise people, to learned people, obviously. Otherwise, not learned people will understand on their own level. Everybody understands. But someone who's learned and knows that the psukim come from the Torah, the Haggadah doesn't even put it in. Now, that's the background. The, the Torah just quotes my Hukim The Torah doesn't quote Vayaki or Vayaki That's not quoted. But the Haggadah expects you, or at least this interpretation, the God would expect you to know that. And that's the key difference. Now, what's the other fundamental point, of course, really very important to point out? Rasha So I love the interpretation Rabbi Jonathan Sachs. Allah uh, Shalom gave. <clears throat> he says that try it's it, you know he has a beautiful Haggadah. I mean everything he writes is 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 beautiful. I don't know how many people have read his Haggadah with like the twenty articles and then you know his commentary, but some of his articles are amazing. Um, so he says by the Russia Mava that Lachem the Russia quote unquote turns to his parents. Who's Lachem? Lachem are his parents. Mava that's Lachem. Mom and dad, you're upset. I'm intermarrying. What, what did you do? You didn't keep kosher. You didn't keep Shabbos. You didn't send me to Jewish school. You told me about love and, and humanity and, and ethics. What's wrong with intermarriage? What does Judaism mean to you that you expect me to keep it? Well, we all know that. I mean, my, my father was a rabbi for many, many years. And, you know, parents would sometimes come complaining to him. Their child wants to intermarry. I don't know what my father actually said to the, uh, the parents, but what he told us in the family well, you know, what do you expect? The parents did nothing. They come to show maybe I'm Rosh Hashanah, I'm Kippur. Well, why shouldn't the kid intermarry, right? I mean, inter, you know, you know I, I always say many of the kids I teach and I, told, I, I, I agree with them. I understand it on one level. They're in favor of intermarriage in theory. Just thank God, most of them not in practice. In other words, the idea that you don't marry somebody for religious reason, that sounds, I, I, don't, wanna, I don't wanna say what it sounds like in the modern world. That's not how we live for religion going again. Now, of course, of course, we have beautiful, we only have to marry one person. I, we give out beautiful things, but that's because we're committed to the system. If you're not committed to Judaism, wh why does it matter? And I know people today, they intermarried. It's like not keeping kosher. I don't keep Shabbos. I, I intermarry. I'm going to go past, like I go to Shor Shana. I, I teach kids like that. I teach some kids in school. One parent, what I, I interview, so what? We're going to raise our kids as, as Jewish. So we don't accept that halachically, but there's a lot of, there. there's something, that argument is not a bad argument. I mean, if the parents don't give the kids, so it's just, why, why should they? Why shouldn't they intermarry? So that's what Jonathan Sachs. Ma'avarot lachem, the Russia turns to his parents and said, what did you do to make Judaism meaningful in our life? It's so it's, it's for us who are parents, it's a very important message for us. Don't worry about the kids. Worry about us. But why is the Russia so, why does the author of that got to say, why is the Russia so terrible? The fisha hotzi et at small min haklau. He removed himself from the community. Kafar be'ikar. Wow. He's, a, you know what a kofar be'ikar, like an, an atheist, you know, he's a kofar. Kofar Pekar is even a Kofar is a guy who says, like, you know, not all of the Torah was given by God. It was written. But he's a Kofar. He's a Kofar. A Kofar Pekar. Whoa. I mean, he's a, the, a okay, the, he, the, he denies, denies the essence, the, the Ikar, the main point of Judaism. What's the main point of Judaism, according to the Haggadah? To be part of the Jewish people. The Fisha Hosi at Atzmo Min Haklau. The Haggadah is interpreting for you, not for me. Good. That's the top heresy in Judaism, not to feel part of it. It's an unbelievable statement. The Rambam Paskins in Hilchot Shuva, it's probably where the Rambam gets it from, I'm sure is here. You know, the Rambam never quotes his sources. The Rambam quotes that a Jew who is not part of the community loses his share in the world to come. The Rambam has the 24 people who lose their share in the world to come. One who denies the Torah was written by God, one who denies Moshe is the greatest prophet, and all the things the Rambam has in faith. Whether, whether we accept the Rambam or not is irrelevant. Included in that list is a person who's not part of the, the community. He doesn't identify as the community. Uh -huh. and it's, un, it's an unbelievable, powerful thing. Rav Soloveitchik in Alachuva has a whole essay about this. In the second essay in Alachuva, which everybody should read, 
Even for Pesach, it's not bad reading, but okay, be reading before Rosh Hashanah Yom Kippur, fine. But you can read it before Pesach too. So in al he has a whole piece there about being part of the community. And he says it, he in a sense is being, he's critical, uh, he's being critical of the sort of very observant Jews who don't want to involve themselves with uh, other Jewish community. And he puts it in a Zionistic perspective. In other words, um, that, that you can, he said, you can daven all day and learn Torah all day, but if you're not part of a community at large, this is what the Haggadah says about you. It's, it's a pretty powerful piece. So Rav, Rav Soloveitch explained the whole notion, the importance of joining a community, right? We've discussed um, sinners, are, that's how we begin Yom Kippur. Sinners, come. Uh, we want to dive in with the sinners. That's great, right? So the importance of community. What's the first thing we tell a convert who wants to convert? What's the first thing that Mar says we have to tell a convert? Don't. I'm sorry? Don't. Jump. Don't convert. Oh, don't convert. But okay, why shouldn't he convert? The first thing we and the first thing we tell them is, do you know what it means to be a Jew? It's not Shabbos, it's not Kashrut, it's not Tarnish Pacha. It's we have a historical mission, and the nations of the world don't like our historical mission. There's anti-Semitism, right? We, you know, a lot of Orthodox Jews they criticize. Oh, they just care about anti-Semitism. You know, they they worry about they don't worry about Jewish education. They worry about anti-Semitism. Well, that's the first thing the the Gemara says about a convert. You know what it means to be a Jew? A Jew has a special place in this world and it engenders anti-Semitism. And you got to know about that. And if you're willing, kablimo <clears> tomiyad. <throat> Look at to them, unbelievable expression. I didn't put in the source in Yavama. <clears throat> we accept him immediately. He doesn't know one thing. Of, I mean, maybe he knows because, uh, you know, I don't know, but the Gemara says not one word about any mitzvah. After we accept him as a convert because he identifies as a Jew, He's not, I don't know how religious he is. Maybe he eats on Yom Kippur, but he identifies as a Jew. He's part of the community. Then we have to teach him six mitzvot, the Gemara says. What are the six mitzvot? I guess no one's converted in a long time. The six mitzvot are leket, shichicha, peya, fruit, right? Fruit, the movie, like in the farmer's field, maser ani. So four of the six relate to helping the poor. Why did God take us out of Egypt? Our talk last week to be nice to the poor, to be nice to the stranger. So the, we, we first say to the non-Jew, do you want to be part of our community? I don't know how religious you're going to be. Want to be part of our community? Again, I'm not getting into a lacking discussion. I know it's a big topic. Thing. Just read the Gemara, what the Gemara says. It's one page in Yavamas, Mem Dalit, I believe. Mem Dalit or Mem Bab. So do you want to be Jewish? Then we tell them four meets for of being nice to the poor. Then we tell them Shabbos and Kashrut. The mission has done a little bit here. So that's a fast, but you see, being not identifying as a Jew, that's what's make you a Russia. It's a beautiful, I think it's a very powerful, very uh, beautiful and important idea. Okay, a couple other things about, um, I imagine, you know, I, I didn't read the article, but I just saw they had big parties this week because uh, the Lubavitcher, I don't know if it's his 120th birthday or 120 years since he was born. It depends on, you know, what, uh, well, anyway. So, uh, so um, <clears throat> right, I'm sure most people, I, I heard this as a, a kid. Mo most people have heard about the, they call him, the Friediger Rebbe, right? I don't know any Yiddish. The, the previous Rebbe, the one who died in 1950, his, the father-in-law of Menachem Mendel, uh, you know, Schneerson. So, you know, he had that famous comment on the four children being the four generations of immigration to America. Right? The people are aware of that? Yeah, everybody knows that one? That's hard on a, a computer screen when people don't have their faces. I can't tell if they know yet. But uh, very, very, very briefly, very, I, I thought it's quite famous. I don't know. Um, he said that the four, I mean, it's a cute modern interpretation said in the 1940s, I guess, when he came to America and he surveyed America, he said that uh, the four children represents immigration to America. The, the, the Chacham, it's, it's of course not 100% true. You know, it's a historical revisionism a little bit, but okay. Uh, but there is, there is truth to it. it um, that the first generation, that's the, you know, the, the pious Jew in Europe, he come, he's a chacham. He comes to America. The kid throws the tefillin off the boat, grows up in America. He can't be religious in America. That's the Russia. The third generation, no, they go to the grandparents on Friday night. He eats kapilta fish. He knows he knows he's Jewish. His grandfather is very pious. His father isn't interested. His father wants to be an American. 
doesn't give him a Jewish education. So the father, the grandfather, the chacham, the father's rich. He's a tam. He knows mazot. What's going on? Okay. And his son knew by that time the grandfather isn't alive anymore. The grandfather is the Russia. He says he's a shenoyah delishol. But at least he stumbles across a pesach seder. He knows he's Jewish. His great grandfather is Jewish. He knows he's Jewish. The fifth child, of course, the fifth son is me. That's a very beautiful. Uh, sad piece or whatever, I don't know, and there's a lot of truth to it, but maybe the fifth son's uh, Baltruva, I don't know. But I remember, and that's in this is also, I think, relatively famous. Tova, if you remember when Joe Berman, you know, used to come to, or I saw that, of course you remember, used to come to our city, he's the, whatever, it's not important, a uh, very fascinating story. They're the big benefactors of Asia Torah in Toronto and uh, probably wouldn't exist if not for the, the, the Berman family and my parents were very close to them, whatever, for, for another time. So they used to come to our Seder every year. They used to go to our Seder and Rabbi Hoch from Asia Torah on the second night. And um, um, so I remember he said that, um, of course, the four children, it's I first heard from him, he said, of course, it's one person. We're all the four children. Uh, we have all these tendencies within it. We're Chacham, Rasha, Tam, Shino, Yadeli, Shola, all at the same time. And then he said, of course, it can be um, a story of how we, we grow up. That um, when you're a little kid, you know, two, three years, you don't know how to ask. You're Shino, you're totally dependent. In the sense, on the mother. You're totally dependent on other. Shino, Yadeli, Shola. Then you become seven, eight, nine. Kids are so innocent. Tam Yaakov Ishtam. Tamimus. Purity. Sim simplicity and purity. Those are little, are, you know, eight, nine. You know, you never, you come to the border, do you have anything to declare? And you say, I don't, the kid will pipe up, the eight-year-old kid. Oh, what do you mean? You bought a, this, right? Kids are so honest and innocent and pure and so beautiful. That's why the, you had the kids on top of the Aaron in the Beit Amikdash, that images the grooming were kids because kids are pure. How about, you know, God shall bait Rabban. That's what keeps the world going. The breath of little children learning to our adults. There's, we've corrupted ourselves. So um, so we're all Tom. And then you come a teenager, come a Russia. That, that's how God created us. Teenagers are meant to rebel. A lot of it is good to have a little, uh, not too much, but a little bit, it's okay. So got to get, that's why the Torah has no punishment till the age of, of 20, right? You're not fully bar mitzvah at, at 13 or 12. That's the beginning of the process. The Torah understood where we, we don't give any punishments. The courts don't wear it till you're 20. It's not the mature enough. He's a rebellious here. And then hopefully you turn into a chacham. So you have the four children in reverse. I, I don't know how many years ago, Tova, he said that at our Seder, probably 35 years ago at our Seder, you know. So um, anyways, I thought that was a beautiful... Um, a beautiful idea. It was probably more than 35 years, actually. Anyways, okay, those are just some points on the Chacham. Then I just, let, let me add one more point, and I don't see how much more we'll get to discuss. Please, God, in future years. The Talmud Yerushalmi, I think uh, Ari Murmelstein talked about this a little bit, but I'm going to say a different aspect. Um, the Talmud Yerushalmi, you know, reverses the answers to the Chacham and the Tam. First of all, the Tam is known as the Tipesh, which is quite fascinating, but they revert a, a fool. We, Tom, you know, Tom, we interpret simple, but often it can be pure, like Yaakov Ishtam. And that's all debate. Maybe don't ask too many questions. Maybe that's a higher level, right? Maybe they ask too many questions. You know, that, that's not, I think, the approach of us, not my approach, but there is an idea to ask simple questions. That's sort of a, and I, I don't say it in any negative fashion, but that's like the base Yaakov approach. You know? it's, don't ask too many questions is what we do. God took us out. For some people that works and for some people the my daughter doesn't work too much. The two, they know the contradictions in the Torah. Rabbi Shmuel says, it says at night, at day, well, what's going on in Torah contradicts itself. So not everybody can handle that. I, 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 couldn't, I couldn't not handle that. Like I couldn't live in a world where we wouldn't talk about those things. But other people, it's too disturbing to talk about it. So that's why the four different children, some need, so anyways, the Yerushalmi reverses that. So the, the answer to the Chacham is Why do we do this? Don't give me your questions. God took us out with a strong arm. Now we're telling the Chacham, don't be too smart. God took us out with a strong arm. That's why we do everything, right? And the, the Tam, Mazot, Mazot, Mr. Tam, you know what? You'll, you'll get to the meal soon, just when the Yafi Komen don't eat after the Yafi Komen. Got to give him, because what's the time? He's interested in the food. He's not interested in these discussions. So the Yerushalmi reverses 
the the answers of the Chag Rosh was I it's like it's fascinating. So I just thought one idea, um, and I think perhaps you could combine them. I think the idea here, again, you don't have to agree with me. Um, a question can be simple and profound at the same time. Mazot, what is this can be a very simple question and sometimes a very simple question can be profound or to put it in a slightly different terms, you know, sometimes sometimes non-experts ask the best questions. You know, you, always, you want to get a fresh perspective, like all the scientists, all the doctors looking at something, of course they know much more, but sometimes the non-medical person walks in and he sees something because their training is so different. He sees something that somebody else can't see. So sometimes a question that somebody asks very simple can get the whole ball rolling. I've told the story before, I'll very quickly tell it about the student of mine in chat years ago. Um, it was before Rosh Hashanah. So I was talking about a Sarah Jimei Tshuva. He said, what's a Sarah Jimei Tshuva? So a kid said, I was like blown away. He said, the 10 days of, of answering. A tshuva is the answer. So I was like, whoa, whoa, well, because, you know, uh, 10 days, a tshuva is an answer, 10 days of answering. So I, I instinctively, I said, well, what's the question? Now, I had no idea what I was saying, because I never thought of a certain to make tshuva as the 10 days of, of answering. It's the 10 days of return and repentance. So I said, what's the question? And then as I said, what's the question? I realized what the question was. What's the question? The question was, ayeka. What's the first question in the Torah? God says to Adam, where are you? Where are you? Uh, that happened on, on Rosh Hashanah, according to the rabbis, right? The uh, man was created, first day sin, Rosh Hashanah. Ayaka, where? So, ah, that a search you made tshuva is we have 10 days to answer the question, what are you doing with your life? It's so beautiful. This is some kid in chat who doesn't even know what the search you made tshuva mean, but because she had this little thing, she knows that a tshuva is an answer, that a search you made tshuva, that's a whole new idea. And I wrote a whole to our Torah about that. Now I wrote my Dvar Torah that year about that whole thing. I didn't mention her by name, but I asked her if I can quote her in my Dvar Torah. She said, fine. And um, I sent it out to my whole list. So sometimes a little innocent comment, sometimes a profound, um, you know, a simple question can have profound implications. And sometimes we look for profound answers. And the answer is very simple before our eyes. So I, you know, we look for, oh, complicated. It's right here. It's staring at us. Just the simple, simple things to do. You can even apply it into COVID, you know, the simple things, right? Well, I, prevent, I, I just read uh, there was some a study came out, 95% of COVID can be, I know in most parts of the world, they think COVID is over. I, I'm well aware of that, but uh, I don't know if that COVID agrees that it's over. But, uh, you know, by, by staying six feet, masking and ventilation, that's all I do. You'll get rid of 90%, 95% of, of, of COVID. Just everybody wear a mask indoor. You would stay a social distance. You get rid of and uh, get rid of 95% of COVID. Simple things. So often we look for profound answers. Vaccines, wonderful, fantastic. Uh, it's not, this, this is really our first Pesach. You know, we think the last Pesach, I don't know. I live in Canada. Last Pesach, very few Canadians had a vaccine. I got my first vaccine on March the 13th. Last year, I made it. I want to remember the, the date. I made a Shachayanu. It was Motzei Shabbos. I got it. And as they put in the vaccine, I made a Bracha, um, Shachayanu. And uh, and two weeks later, that was the Saturday night. Two weeks later was Pesach night. Um, but most people weren't vaccinated uh, at that point. And there was only one vaccine. It was uh, two years ago. I don't know if I can tell you where you were for Pesach. So, you know, there's a lot has happened. But um, anyways, that's an idea that sometimes we look for profoundity and the answers are very simple. Okay, I see it's 9.59. I for sure don't want to go over on Erev, uh, Erev you know, Pesach. I really do appreciate that people come. I think it's wonderful that we can learn Erev Pesach. Please go out next Thursday morning, Erev Yontif. We'll have a shear for the last days of Yontif. I hope people aren't as busy for the last days of Yontif than the first date. But uh, so that'll be next. I'll, I'll, I'll send it by email. But let's very, very quickly review the, uh, what we did. Manishtana. It doesn't matter what you ask the questions. The child is supposed to ask whatever. It doesn't matter. If the, the father teaches him Manishtana, or the mother, I guess, today, the mother, father teach them Manishtana. Amazing. And the Gemara says uh, they, they skip Manishtana and the Seder of Rab Nachman. Rab Nachman asked his servant a question. It's funny. His servant gave an answer. Finished. That's it. We don't need money. Start, we go on. The point is to ask questions. Of course, you want to give answers. You want to discuss answers. But the money start, the focal. Arami Ovedavi. That's the focal point. That the Mishnah says. The detail that you have to discuss in great length. 
Um, okay, and then we discussed uh, why we, the more we discussed, because the idea of Pesach is not a historical event, it's a current event, like the whole Torah. It's current times, and we have to be up on that. We have to, how do we apply it, and how do we apply current events, and the war, the world events, and wars, and what does that mean for uh, freedom, and what's our role, and, you know, what, is, what are we supposed to do? It's, these are tough questions, but we have to ask the question. That's the rabbis in B'nai Brach. We're doing all night, and then the students are a little bit of a chutzpah. Maybe it's not a chutzpah. They can tell them they're doing something wrong, perhaps. But I thought it, um, perhaps uh, there's some tension here between the night and the day. The 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 story of the uh, the seder pesach is at night, and uh, kriyat the day kriyat is the only mitzvah day and night because fear and hope. You have to accept God in both situations. And the students didn't understand that the goal of the Seder is to turn the night into day. There will be a time where there will not be any night anymore. Whether that means there won't be night, I don't think it has to mean that physically, of course. And that's what the rabbis were doing. They didn't worry about Shema. They were Sibri, Sibri is a higher level of Shema, perhaps, perhaps. And, uh, and that's what then, and of course, in the historical time period that it happened, that's Rebbe Lesser ben was saying, nobody wanted to say Yitzhi Mitzrayim at night. Nobody wanted to talk about the Exodus. Every, okay, the Seder night, but the rest of the year, they didn't have to. And Rebbe Lesser ben said, no, 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 no. Even in times of great despair, great historical tragedy, we have to talk, we have to remember Pesach. And Pesach, of course, is the day, much as at night. In the temple that they started in the daytime, that's the whole idea. And God's presence, redemption is all day. And then we bring the Pesach slaughtered in the day to the night to, to make our Chag HaMatzor into a Chag HaPesach. We call it, I gave the other reason of Rabbi Yitzchak Pardijim, we call it Chag HaPesach because that's the optimism of the Jew. It's not Chag HaMatzor. Chag HaMatzor, yeah, that's in the Torah. That's when we, we, we daven. But we colloquially, the Jewish people, referred to the holiday as Chag HaPesach, that's the idea of redemption, of turning the night into day. And then we talked about the four children, uh, the three differences perhaps in the Lida, right? saying versus uh, questioning, um, the, the mob mentality versus being an independent thinker and thinking about the long-term and turning to your parents you know, you want me to be Jewish? Raise me Jewish. What does Judaism mean to you? That's the way to influence other of other uh, other people. And then we talked to four generations. We're all we're all four children. That's a powerful idea. And of course, the very important idea: the definition of a Russia is to separate from the Jewish community. And the Jewish community means non-religious people. You can't live in an enclave without. That's what it means. That's what. That's my whole. Uh, you know, attitude of life. That's how I was brought up, and that's all my schooling, and that's a Rep Soloveitchik. You know, we're part of the broader Jewish community at Sibur. Sadikim Benunim Rishan. We begin Yom Kippur welcoming sinners. It's very nice to live, uh, you know, uh, you know, without any uh, quote unquote non religious Jews, whatever that means. But uh, the, the Jewish community, we can't worry only about ourselves. We have to worry about the community. That's a very, the way, that's really the struggle. I don't want to get into it, but we talk about making modern events, Pesach. That's the struggle in Israel. That uh, when we issue a Pesach halacha, or do we only care about the Jews who are, are committed? Then you can issue one halacha ruling. But if you're worried about all citizens of Israel, if it, that's the whole debate on the conversion crisis, right? Are you worrying about the, I don't care about the 400,000 Russians. They're not my community. Who cares? We'll have our standards or no. We have a seal of 7 million Jews. We have to solve the problem. That's a fundamental debate about, and that's whatever. That's what I think one of the messages is of the Pesach Seder. But um, okay, anyways, um, thank you very much. Let me just quickly see if there are any questions. I want to wish everybody a wonderful Pesach. We should have a gula and peace and the night should turn into the day and uh, we should have all good things and uh, should have a wonderful, meaningful Pesach. And uh, I'm happy to hear, you know, any, uh, any criticism and critique of what I have to say. And I hope I gave you some food for thought. And really the whole idea is a springboard, the major is a springboard for further discussion. And please God, we'll see you next week, Thursday. Just let me quickly run through any questions. So into right, I need to, um, we are supposed to run to a mitzvah. Yeah, yeah, okay. What about the honor your father? Read the mitzvah day and night. Yeah, 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 no. Um, honoring, like don't steal, don't murder, honor your parents, of course. Those apply 24 7. I'm talking about mitzvot that have a specific time. They're either in the day or in the, in, in the night. They're not both, only Shema, right? Um, right. So, uh, would you believe the Rosh Bam's theory the day begins, right? The day, according to the Rosh Bam, the Sunday probably begins in the morning. I'll be shot. I'll be Sometimes the Pshan and the Rosh don't agree, 
al pshat or seventy um al pshat um it begins in the morning. That's the Rosh Hashanah. It was so radical. Art scroll sent they refused to publish his commentary in the first chapter. Mark Shapiro wrote a whole piece about that. Uh, you can say uh, we don't like the Rosh Hashanah. Other people disagree with her. That's fine. Censoring the Rosh Hashanah like a little bit, you know, a little bit chutzpah. You know, I we know better than the Rosh Hashanah, but that's how. Judaism works. Barry, I, I see, I know I see you left already, but wow, 72% of Ontario support mask mandate. Yeah, I'm in New York now for Yontif, and uh, I, I, you know, yeah, you, it's very different. And I'm, although, yeah, it's also different in Ontario if you walk into a, a Jewish, a, a store in a Jewish area or a non Jewish area. It's, it's, my sister and I both agree it's very sad. If you walk into Copas or no, whatever these stores, 99.9% uh, 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 people wear masks. You walk into Goldstein's, you know, bakery, uh, 20% wear masks. It's, uh, I don't know, there's something to say that. Um, our most members of Orchheim, so they were vaccinated. Okay, last year. Okay, yeah, doctors got in first. I'm not a doctor. Okay, um, thank you very much. Is it correct to believe that our concept of God as individuals, people use medical advances? That's what God wants. So we have to use all medical advances, absolutely. And the and the Chachma Bagoin and their thoughts of wisdom among the nations of the world. Just choose. Okay, it's late. People have to get. I don't know when your Chamesh time ends here. It ends at ten forty-three. So if I not that if I want to get in a quick bagel, I gotta leave quickly. But okay, we don't have any bagels around here. Anyways, everybody have a wonderful Pesach. Be well and thank you. And we Jay, Shabbat, 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 Shabbat Shalom. Shabbat Shalom. Shabbat Shalom. Shabbat Shalom. Thank you. Chag Sameach. Chag Sameach. Be a wonderful Pesach. Sharon, Sharon sends regards too. Hi. Oh, thank you from Israel. <laughs> nice to yeah. hear you, Rabbi Alman. Nice to see you from from Israel today. Okay, enjoy. Yeah. Yeah, thank Take you. Care. All the best. Thank you. Wonderful Thank you. Okay.